These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. War. War never changes. Tribes, cities, and now great nations fight for the pride and wealth and whatever other excuses they can dream up to turn the men around them into hot-blooded killers. But though it's ingrained in our very nature to make war, the tools we use changes from era to era. In the late Bronze Age, the premier tool of warfare, as much the pinnacle of that era's technology as a fighter plane is in ours, was the chariot. No nation without chariots will defeat any nation who has them for this whole period. The greatest battles of the age will see them deployed in the thousands, and the economics of the warrior elite who rode them will shape the politics for hundreds of years. Chariots, however, are not a new invention. We've seen them since the very first episodes on warfare in ancient Sumer. However, the late Bronze Age chariot is leaps and bounds beyond the old battle wagons of Sumer. In the early days, the idea of melding human and animal power for warfare took the form of a heavy four-wheeled cart pulled by donkeys, or their cousins, the ill-tempered onagers, with a driver and a javelin man in the back. These could do some damage, but they were unwieldy, hard on the animals, and not all that much faster than a good sprinter. In fact, with the rise of the Akkadian Empire and its new logistical power to put greater masses of well-equipped infantry into the field, chariots may have fallen off the front lines altogether, relegated to ceremonial purposes, or converted into regular carts to haul goods. With the Sumerian Renaissance and into the Issan Larsa period, kings would once again experiment with the battle wagon, making a few gradual improvements, but it would not be until around 1600, with the simultaneous appearance of the Mitanni in the north, the Kassites in the south, and the Hyksos in Egypt, that these gradual improvements would encounter the keys that would transform a prestigious combat vehicle into a truly dominant weapon of war. The technological core of the chariot consists of three elements. The compound bow, which is slightly more powerful than the standard bow, but has a much more compact frame that can be fired more easily from a moving platform, allowed a trained shooter to fire from a range that was hard to match by skirmishers while evading countering fire. The horse, being stronger, faster, and tougher than the onagers who had previously pulled the carts of old, gave the chariot the speed it needed to act with both tactical flexibility and sheer power, allowing the warrior to skirmish, duel, charge, or run down fleeing opponents with impunity. And finally, innovations made to the structure of the chariot itself some occurring slowly over hundreds of years, while others seeming to pop in overnight, allowed the cart itself to be more rugged and more flexible, an advantage that different nations used in different ways to outfit their warriors to be either the quickest on the battlefield or the most devastating on the charge. The tale of the late Bronze Age chariot really begins with the Mitanni, the Indo-European invaders who have begun to consolidate their hold over the Hurrian lands of the north. These were not the only people of the 1600s to bring the horse-drawn chariot into the Near East, as we've seen the Kassites and Hyksos also make sudden strikes in this period, and Babylon, Egypt, and the Hittites were all quick to adopt the new weapon. But in the early period, no one is more feared than the Marianu charioteers of Mitanni. This is actually a point relevant to Mitanni history as much as it is the history of regional warfare, since to a great extent, the Mitanni state was the Marianu, an individual Marya, which is likely related to the Sanskrit word meaning young man or perhaps hero, was the pinnacle of his society a member of a small band of varying size beneath either a lord or a more distinguished warrior. He was highly trained and highly armored, fast enough that no infantryman could catch him, and with the world's first bronze scale armor adorning his body and his horse, it would take overwhelming force or exceedingly good luck to bring him down. Indeed, so fearsome did these glittering metal warriors look when they appeared in Hurrian towns 
that many simply accepted Mitanni rule without a fight. The Mitanni political order was an extension of their military organization, and there is a possibility that it just didn't extend very much past the organization required to support the Marianu warrior nobility. The fundamental unit of civil administration was the Hausu military district, a small area with a few villages with a fortified manor house in the middle. These villages themselves were often walled and well within easy reach of the manor house, meaning that the local mayor, who kept a small professional garrison on hand at all times, could reach any of the towns under his remit relatively quickly. While many details of the Mitanni military organization remain unclear, the squad-level equivalent was led by a man called a Rob. But, quite tellingly, the various Robs we have evidence for are usually indicated with a number after the name. Rob 5, or Rob 10, or Rob 12, or whatever, designating the precise number of men in that leader's squad. This speaks to a profoundly informal sort of organization, where teams of men come together more by proximity or tribal ties or just friendship groups, and the resulting band of brothers can be of a different size in different places. With this uncertainty at the very lowest level of Mitanni organization, it's perhaps no wonder that we frequently get very non-round numbers for the amounts of various soldiers mustered in various contexts. Structurally, then, the Mitanni seem to have been quite content with a somewhat loose organizational system, one focused on exalting and ennobling the individual Maria warrior. We could think quite clearly of a knight in feudal Europe, as well as the heroic champions of the Trojan War, to get a sense of how they may have viewed their role in both society and in combat. Logistically, no one knows how they were organized in the early days, but they seem to have quickly adopted a version of the Babylonian Ilkum system. However, it was not land that the state provided, but the very chariots, horses, weapons, and bronze scale mail armor that the Marianu needed to earn their livelihood. Land was for ruling over, not farming, as was expected of Babylonian warriors, and was gained through expanding the borders of the kingdom and being given command over a Halsu military district. Alternately, Amarya would pledge himself to one already in command, joining his small squad of retainers. Amarya would spend his entire day training, looking after his own fitness and that of his horse and in return, they enjoyed a reputation as peerless individual warriors, not unlike the Spartans a thousand years later. From Egyptian records, we know that the enemies of the Mitanni considered any single Maria killed or captured in battle to be an accomplishment worthy of being recorded separately, and for a single Egyptian warrior to take one down would award him special merit, sometimes from the Pharaoh himself. But most interestingly, it's from the Hittites that we learn the most about Mitanni training regimens. Sometime around 1400, a master horse trainer was hired by the Hittite court, a resident of Mitanni named Kikuli, and his seven-month training program proved so effective that it was written down and preserved in the Hittite royal archives in Hattusha. In this text, we see that the horse was meant to be built up slowly over 214 days, with rest periods and high-intensity periods, using methods quite similar to modern interval training. The horse would be fed on a variety of grains to keep a well-balanced diet, and fasted at periods to build further endurance, cutting and bulking the animal like a modern athlete. The training included night maneuvers and swimming, both to exercise more muscles and to acclimate it to different conditions, and it would often be put under heavy blankets to acclimate it further to high heat. To allow it to get more oxygen, since you can't really teach a horse breathing techniques, its nose would be slitted along the sides, which I'm told doesn't hurt the animal after the initial shock of cutting any more than a person getting an earring. Indeed, while the horse has worked hard during this boot camp period, it was also taken care of with careful attention to detail, having its coat and mane trimmed and brushed regularly, 
since apparently a clean horse keeps the hairs from tangling within the reins and gear. In fact, in the early 1990s, archaeologist and horse enthusiast Anne Nyland decided to use the Kikuli method on some of her own horses in Australia. She found the results to be comparable to modern athletic training, and in fact it seems the horses came out in some ways stronger and healthier than she had experienced from doing conventional, science-backed modern training. That was, of course, 30 years ago, and nowadays it's possible that some of these Kikuli methods have been integrated into modern horse training. I'm not actually an equestrian. I don't really know. We know much less about the physical conditioning of the chariot crews themselves, though we can infer from a number of places that they were in remarkable shape, either by modern or ancient standards. We know a little bit more about their training, which mostly involved hours and hours every day on the chariot, practicing combat, archery, and maneuvers. They would hold contests at night at full speed, where they would shoot targets at various distances. They would run the squad in formation at full speed, and at a certain point deliberately crash the lead vehicle to make sure that everyone else knew how to quickly weave around it without causing a pileup like you might see in the movies. We can infer that they must have known the benefits of interval and endurance training for themselves if they were applying it to their horses, and there are a few scattered references to charioteers engaging in racing and trick maneuvers to hone their skills even further. The Marianu were professional charioteers, an elite within an elite, both socially and militarily, and they dedicated their entire lives to becoming maximally proficient with their tools. This very success, however, would rapidly be emulated by neighboring countries. After all, chariots were both devastatingly effective and incredibly sexy, having been a prestige vehicle even before they truly dominated the battlefield. Soon, every nation large enough would be emulating the success of the Mitanni with their own chariot programs, as seen in the Hittite poaching of Kakuli for their own horse program. Still, the Marianu would never lose pride of place as elite warriors for as long as the Mitanni remained a great power in the Near East. Perhaps the best attested of the charioteering programs of the age is the Egyptian one, and here we can see most clearly the engineering and technological side of what allowed the chariot to grow so terrifying. A decent number of full chariots have been unearthed from the famous tombs of the Egyptian deserts, including six from the famous tomb of King Tut, along with few horses to pull them. The carpentry on these is at a remarkably high level, and for something produced under the limitations of Bronze Age technology, they're quite a bit more rugged than might be expected. A few of the innovations that made the late Bronze Age chariot possible had arisen in Babylonia and Sumer during the Middle Bronze Age. One key change was in harnessing. In previous times, the horse had been tied by the neck with a flexible harness, putting a strain on a relatively sensitive part of the horse's anatomy and limiting what it could hold without hurting itself. Now, however, a much more rigid harness was placed on the animal's shoulders, allowing it to pull with less strain on its body and to apply the force of its legs more directly on the load. Additionally, it was noticed that pushing the wheels closer to the center of the cart improved the animal's endurance substantially. Recall that these are horses, but they have not yet been bred to modern standards. Evidence from Egyptian harnesses suggests that they were using horses a bit under four and a half feet tall at the shoulders, 13 hands in the modern horse measuring system, making them quite small by modern standards. Most were unable to bear the weight of a rider very well, and the further to the rear of the vehicle the wheels were, the more downwards weight was being placed on the horse's shoulders. This is just basic leverage here, forcing it to struggle against gravity as well as the cart's inertia. This is why the very earliest chariots actually had four wheels instead of two to counteract this. However, 
By having the two wheels directly under the center of gravity, the wheels themselves would be holding the entire weight, leaving the horses free to use all their energy on propulsion. You still had weight limits and you had a bit less stability, but you could put quite a bit more onto the cart without killing the horses. The Egyptians, however, saw that having the horse less encumbered gave the animal greater speed and allowed the cart to turn, accelerate, and stop much faster. Remember that even if the horse isn't holding up the weight of the chariot anymore, it still has to deal with the inertia of starting, stopping, and turning. The lighter the chariot could be made, then the faster it would be. One of the most revolutionary improvements were in the revolving parts, the wheels. In the old days, these were solid planks, either one huge round piece or more often three or four planks bound together with mortise and tenons held in with interlocking dowels and supported by glues. As you can see, pretty sophisticated even in the early and middle Bronze Ages. Once pieced together, the hulking piece would be cut into a circular shape and have a hole drilled out of the center for an axle. As you can imagine, this was massively heavy and added substantially to the chariot's inertia, as well as to its downward weight, making it more likely to get bogged down in less than perfect terrain. However, with the discovery of a technique that used steam to allow wood to bend and hold shape in curved positions, suddenly it was possible to make just a thin wooden ring, supported usually with six internal spokes, cutting the weight substantially. This wheel could have been covered with a strip of leather to improve traction, durability, and smooth out the ride, functioning like a thin tire. The wheel was attached to the cart on an axle, which slotted into a pair of smooth bearings, not terribly unlike modern journal bearings. Initially, this was a hardwood axle to prevent breakage, but by the end of this period, they found that softwood axles allowed for a better performance thanks to lower internal friction and would come to mass produce identical axles, with the idea of making them fully replaceable standardized parts as they wore out. With carefully selected wood assembled with a high degree of craftsmanship, the unladen Egyptian chariot weighed on average no more than 30 kilograms. By removing even the front cover, turning it from a half basket into a series of rails, the weight could be reduced even further. Pulled by two horses, it could reach speeds of 30 miles per hour, even with two armored men in back, and was capable of quick maneuvers that no other nation's chariotry could match. These ultralight chariots were employed almost exclusively as archers, with numerous pharaohs boasting of their personal skill at shooting from a moving vehicle, sometimes while acting as their own driver at the same time. But while the ability to remain always at arm's length from the enemy while pelting them with arrows would have been frustrating for any opposing army, this doesn't mean that they always or even commonly avoided riskier tactics. In what must have been one of the most terrifying spectacles of the ancient world, a wide formation of chariots would bring their horses to full gallop, thundering for hundreds of meters directly at the enemy formation, firing arrows indiscriminately as they approached. Then, at the last minute, just as the infantry was braced for an attack, they could pivot on a dime, unload another volley, and wheel away. Shaken and still pelted by arrows, a mass of infantry may already be en route, or they may be vulnerable to a secondary strike by any sort of flanking troops, or by the Egyptian infantry runners, who followed the highly mobile force. This was another key to the success of the Egyptian chariots, the fact that they operated in a combined arms approach alongside an elite, lightly armored group of infantry. Each chariot would be tailed by a handful of men running at full speed to keep up with the horses, who would usually be kept at a light trot for the sake of both the runners and the horses. The exact tactical role of these runners is unclear, but they may have been responsible for protecting the chariot if it got swarmed, for assisting in chariot duels by killing anyone who fell off, or by providing a second level of attack to accompany particular tactics, such as the false charge described just a moment ago. 
It also isn't clear who these runners are, whether they were a dedicated set of footmen, or if they were aspiring charioteers who had yet to earn a chariot, or had lost their chariot in battle. Of course, once other nations heard of the success of the Egyptian runners system, this too could have been adapted around the region. But making the chariot lighter was not the only developmental path available for the advanced construction techniques. The Hittites, with their more rugged terrain and more compact battlefields in Anatolia, created the heaviest chariots of the Late Bronze Age. Made of far more rugged timbers, with the wheels much closer to the center of gravity to offset the additional weight, the Hittite chariot could carry in later periods up to three men, each wearing scale mail, with armored horses and an armored chariot body as well, all with bronze scales about one inch by a quarter inch in length. These much heavier chariots would, whenever possible, be set up in position to ambush, and a favorite tactic was either to engage the main enemy force with the infantry before hitting hard with the chariots, or to strike first with the chariots, then follow up with the brutal Hittite infantry to cut into the broken up formation. Of course, with the heavier Hittite chariots, we get into a bit of a controversial aspect of chariot warfare. There exists, and has for a number of decades, a group of modern scholars who believe that no chariot was ever deliberately charged into a mass of infantry. They contend that even the most robust of chariots was still quite fragile, and it could easily be swarmed once a few collisions had slowed or stopped it, at which point the horses would be speared, and the occupants pulled out and slaughtered or captured. This, combined with the tremendous expense of the chariot, the horse, and the highly trained aristocratic riders, means that in this view, the very s means in this view that the sort of dramatic charge that would look great in movies was a tremendous risk for very little reward. In defense of this, there is no written or artistic account that definitively states that chariots were used to charge into infantry, or proving that they were ever intended to engage in any but the most incidental of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Additionally, they will sometimes insist that horses will simply refuse to charge into a large, unmoving mass of men as part of their natural self-preservation instinct. That being said, it is hard to understand the comparative advantage of heavy Hittite chariots without assuming that it was meant to make a charge, at least sometimes. The reasoning of people who believe they were made to charge is that, aside from mere considerations of form, the notion that a massive armored war machine that had just plowed through five rows of men would immediately be set upon by the men around them ignores an important aspect of the psychology of warfare. Unless these men were extremely disciplined or fanatical, odds are that the shock of the impact would lead them to break formation, or even to flee the field entirely. Additionally, while one chariot can conceivably be stopped in its tracks, a whole squad of them can be imagined to devastate an infantry formation completely should they hit right. As to the behavior of horses, it must be remembered that even if an animal did have last-minute hesitations, by the time it reached the enemy line, it has hundreds of pounds of momentum fastened to its shoulders, and may not have been able to stop even if it wanted to. There's no doubt that the chariot was not invincible, and must surely have sometimes fallen victim to the fragility of its construction, or the many vulnerabilities it possessed. But the idea that it would never plow through masses of men, never run down enemy infantry, and never engage in close-range jousts with other chariots seems to me unlikely. Charioteering in the late Bronze Age existed on a spectrum, with the heavy hitters of the Hittites on one end and the nimble skirmishers of the Egyptians on the other, with the various cities and powers of Anatolia, Syria, Mitanni, Assyria, and Babylon occupying spaces somewhere between these two extremes. 
an Egyptian charioteer, may well have gone his whole career in the relative safety of bowshot range, but almost certainly the crash of horse and wood on men rang out upon the battlefields of the late second millennium. The chariot, as has already been mentioned, was as expensive as it was effective, not just in construction, but in the costs of maintaining the horses and men who had to be completely dedicated to this weapon of war. It's probably this single fact more than anything else that sees the world transform from a mostly blank map dotted with mostly independent tribes and towns around 1600 into the state we see around 1400. A smaller kingdom simply couldn't compete with a larger chariot arm kingdom. When actually puts us in something which actually puts us in something of a bind for describing what a chariot battle looked like, since battles tended to be quite one sided. But we can look near the end of this transitional dark age to the military campaigns of the man who may have been Egypt's greatest strategist. Pharaoh Tutmos III, who took full control of Egypt around the year 1458 BCE. Marching out only days after the previous pharaoh, his famous and infamous mother Hatshepsut had passed away, Tutmos marched with the full might of the Egyptian army out the Sinai and into the land of Canaan. He faced essentially no opposition for three months, as town after town renewed their oaths of loyalty made during the reign of his grandfather, Tutmos I. In the ninth month of the year, however, Tutmos finally encountered resistance. The cities of Syria were quite happy to be independent. The Mitanni were far away, the Egyptians had been focused inwards for a generation, and the Hittites were weak. They had secured some assistance from the Mitanni, including some of the famous Marianu charioteers, and declared themselves wholly independent from their former Egyptian masters. Seeing the Egyptians coming up the Levantine coast, they selected the best town they could spot and fortified there. The town of Megiddo will become world famous in the Iron Age for another battle in which an independent people of the Levant tried to fend off the Egyptians though in this second battle, a thousand years later, it will be the Jews fighting off the Egyptians, and the place name will have changed to Har Megiddo, known as Armageddon in Greek. But here and now, while it would be the largest single battle of Tutmos's career, this first battle of Megiddo will have nothing to do with the apocalyptic implications of the second. The city of Megiddo is surrounded by hills on the west and east, leaving the approaching Egyptians to ponder which of the two approaches would be more profitable, north or south. While the strategic side of this story is a bit more drawn out than this, the short version is that Tutmos decided that he would take neither the north or south routes, both of which were well defended by waiting Canaanites and their allies. Instead, he brought his army in secret through a narrow path in the middle, arriving behind enemy lines and catching the Canaanites completely by surprise. It seems the battle proceeded too quickly to even involve the infantry, for the pharaoh's thousand chariots charged on the shocked Canaanite chariots, thundering towards them as if to ram them head on, letting loose missiles all the while. Whether this was meant to be a false charge where they would wheel at the last minute or a pass through where the loose formations would allow two groups of chariots to simply pass through each other with a minimum of collisions but a maximum of close range kill shots or a proper attempt at a melee joust with the pharaoh himself at the head is unclear because in the end the Canaanites simply fled. Morale broken at the terror of the charge, and made their way into the city. In their haste, the enemy charioteers left a great deal of plunder, and though Tutmos continued to drive his horses and bodyguard towards the open city gate, the majority of his chariot elite abandoned the fight completely to ensure that they got their share of the plunder. By the time order was restored in the Egyptian ranks, the Canaanites who had survived the post-battle slaughter had made it into the city and shut the doors behind them, some even being lifted up the wall by their comrades who had made impromptu ropes by tying their own clothes together. 
10,000 infantrymen and 1,000 charioteers had nine months of siege ahead of them, a prospect surely made more terrifying by having to endure the wrath of a pharaoh who had lost his victory at the last moment through their ill discipline. In the end, the city did fall after being starved out, and the plunder that was brought back to Egypt as a result of the entire campaign proved to be enormous, filling long lists on the pharaoh's subsequent monuments to this triumph. But though he would coast from one victory to another, Tutmosis' own brilliance would come to rob him of glory. On his eighth or ninth campaign a decade later, he decided that he was tired of Mitanni interference in the Egyptian vassals of Syria and launched a lightning strike to the Euphrates River. Opting to take ships most of the way up the Mediterranean coast, landing at the loyal city of Byblos, Tutmos marched the largest army Egypt may ever have assembled up to that point across Syria bringing with them 8,000 horses, serving perhaps two to 4,000 chariots. He may have had every single war horse in Egypt with him on the campaign, which both highlights the size of this particular campaign, as well as the relative scarcity of horses in this early period. Seriously, the mighty power of Egypt, a few hundred years after the introduction of horses, has only managed to raise 8,000 of them which should give you an idea of how much a commitment of resources and effort these animals were, even for the very wealthiest of regimes. As mentioned in the previous episode, Tutmos would reach the Euphrates River in this campaign. But what I didn't mention is that he reached the river in record time, getting his army to the Euphrates about as fast as messengers from the previous cities could make it there. Then, instead of being stymied at the river and spending weeks or months building a flotilla to cross it, allowing the Mitanni Tyne to assemble an army and confront him in force, he pulled out the prefabricated boats that his army had brought with them, expecting this very scenario, and crossed it in a matter of days. The first Hurrian towns that the Egyptian army hit had no idea they were coming. The Mitanni system of stationing a few squads of Marianu at each fortress capital of each military district was fine for bandits, rebellions, or small wandering tribes of nomads, but against the Egyptian army, they were powerless to do anything but hide in caves and wait for the storm from the Nile to pass. Those few who dared to resist were run down by chariots, and town after town was plundered faster than the Mitanni king could even learn what was happening, let alone assemble a response force. Indeed, the annals of Tutmos say that the victory here was so one-sided that they went to go hunt elephants to relieve the boredom, and made sure to leave before any real response could be mustered. Thus, the great conflict between Egypt and Mitanni of 1450 ended with a whimper, not a bang. Indeed, perhaps the only great single battle of the Late Bronze Age will not happen until Kadesh around 1274. Instead, the dominance of the chariot will be expressed not on the battlefield, but in one-sided lightning raids and overwhelming attacks in either direction. But what about the infantrymen in all this? Mass armies in the high thousands and low tens of thousands will continue to be mustered, and they will continue to be indispensable in small conflicts, in sieges, in holding territory, and providing logistical support, fighting in much the same way they had in the previous era. However, for these few hundred years, infantry will not be the deciding force in any major field battle, being relegated to a purely secondary role on the plains of death dominated by the great war machine of the late Bronze Age. Now we are done with war and conflict, not by a long shot, but hopefully this has been a good primer on the sexiest part of late Bronze Age battles, and given us a sense of how the intertwined military and political arms of the great nations operated. Next week, however, we will be shifting our focus even more solidly on the Hurrian people, looking at an aspect of their culture that's both heavily influenced by their neighbors and would heavily influence those neighbors in return, as the expanding Mitanni kingdom helped Hurrian culture penetrate deep into Anatolia. So next time, 
we begin what will almost certainly be a multi-part retelling of the greatest myth cycle of northern Mesopotamia, a tale which will affect the mythological landscape up to the modern period, the Kumarbi cycle. Thank you for listening.